so I am Abhay and I am currently working at the Orlando Institute at Jodhpur. It's an upcoming institution and thankfully we have uh, a very good interventionist. So, but unfortunately most of what we see today is, uh, most of what we see today is uh, largely neglected work because we are yet to, you know, full-fledgedly start our trauma center. But all the same. So when I was actually making this lecture, what important thing that I actually was thinking that how do I talk about assessment and uh, how assessment can change in different categories of uh, pelvic trauma unless uh, we've already talked something about a classification. And the thing about classification in pelvic injury is that there are more than 40 classification systems. And when there is uh, such an extensive classification system, that means there is no consensus, right? So unlike the acetabular fractures where the classification system is, is one which most acetabular surgeons use, pelvic fracture classification systems are not the gold and uh, we've not reached the final uh, uh, holy grail as of today so why do you want to classify you want to define and know what is the mechanism of injury because if i do not know the mechanism of injury i will not know the extent of damage i will not be able to plan my intervention so it defines the severity of damage for me and what else it does is that it helps in pred predicting the prognosis of injury and it assets assists a surgeon in selecting the appropriate treatment. But the problem with the pelvic classification systems is that none does everything at the same time. And that's actually the reason why there are so many classification systems, but there is no actually consensus on which one we use. And the classification system basically, you know, what we need to identify and learn is that what it tells us about a hemodynamically unstable patient. So what is most important is the concept of stability. And stability essentially is defined as the ability of this pelvic ring to withstand physiological loading. So if a pelvis can withstand physiological loading, it is stable. If a pelvis cannot withstand physiological loading, it is unstable. And the most important thing that we need to understand about a pelvic uh, ring is that 60% of this stability comes from behind. So there are different concepts and there have been talks of having a posterior middle and an anterior column here as well. But you know, for simplicity sakes, 60% of the stability comes from behind. The anterior sacroiliac ligament, the introscious sacroiliac ligament and most of all the posterior sacroiliac ligament. So unless your posterior sacroiliac ligament is damaged, your pelvis will not go into a vertical shear. You will still have a moderately unstable patient or a stable patient, right? Or a partial stability. And 40% of this stability comes from the front. And as we discussed, there are so many classification systems, but uh, there is no consensus among pelvic astabular surgeons as to which classification system do we use. And there is no inter or intra observer significant reliability on which one I'm going to be using. But this is one classification system and I'll come to why, which more or less is a simple and easy classification system to use because it tells us a lot about what we are dealing with, right? And the essential things in this classification system are that the pelvis can open up. So the pelvic volume can increase. The pelvis can undergo a lateral compression. So the pelvic volume can actually decrease or actually increase, but the ring can collapse or get constricted or compressed and thereby have a solid organ or a visceral organ injury. The posterior sacroiliac ligament could be broken from uh, broken thereby causing a vertical shear or it could be a combination of the two. And very often it is practically impossible in real life situations to really put a finger 
that this is what I am treating or this is what I am coming across and specially the combination injuries. But one has to have an idea as to what we are dealing with because if you have an anterior posterior compression injury, you basically have an expansion of the pelvic volume. And if you have more than 20 to 40 percent expansion of the pelvic volume which is equivalent to about more than 5 centimeters of diastasis anteriorly, there is a high risk of a threatening vascular bleed, either venous or arterial, 80 percent of the times venous, 10 to 20 percent of the times arterial. If you have a lateral compression injury, then the obvious thing is that there is a higher incidence of having a solid or a visceral organ damage because the pelvis is going to collapse on one side or compress on one side. You may have a APC type configuration on the other side. So, that is why it is sometimes very difficult to say what we are dealing with. But this perhaps is the most uh, logical classification system as of today. Why? Because it is descriptive. It is most appropriate for the early pelvis, pelvis surgeon because it is kind of addressing most of the issues that one has to deal with in the pelvic trauma. It correlates with the quantum of fluid resuscitation because if you have an APC type of injury, you know that my patient is going to go into a volume depletion and I need to take care of the fluid replacement. It correlates with associated skeletal and solid organ damage based on the lateral compression type. It is a measure of the quantum of energy that has gone through the pelvis. Another injury which kind of structurally classification with kind of structurally looks at the type of damage you can have in the bone is the Kellam and Browner and I have put this classification system essentially to highlight that these are the patterns that you could come across with a pelvic injury configuration. So, you could have a pure pubic symphysis diastasis. So, you have an instability, the levels of the symphysis here are different and there is a slight opening here. You could have a vertical fracture which divides the pubic ramus and goes through the obturator membrane and it can happen on both sides which is usually a stable injury. You could have a combination of a pelvis and an acetabulum fracture as you have here and when you have a combination of a pelvis and an acetabulum fracture the most common variety of acetabular fracture that you come across is the transverse fracture when you have a pelvis and an acetabular fracture combined. So, when you have an acetabulum do not forget to see if there is a posterior sacroiliac ring uh, disruption or a ring breakage at either anterior or posterior levels and when you have a pelvic injury be very sure that you do not have an associated transverse fracture of the acetabulum which is the commonest injury. The other thing I would like to highlight is that whenever there is a break in the uh, pelvic ring, if the displacement is not, there are two things, one the displacement is minimal and you are coming across a stable situation. The other thing is that your patient is not very stable but the displacement is apparently not clear. So, you should it should ring an alarm bell that very often in pelvic injury situations the damage is not just what you will be seeing on a plain x-ray alone. So, you need to be sure that your patient may have other things along with the pelvic injury. So, the Kellam and Browner classification essentially also talked about the transiliac fracture without a sacroiliac disruption or you could have a sacroiliac disruption and the crescent injury or you could have a pure sacroiliac disruption or you could have a sacral fracture. So, largely what we need to understand about pelvis and pelvic classifications is that you have one situation where the ring is peripherally disturbed. So, it is essentially a stable situation, your patient should more or less be comfortable, which should not be hemodynamically unstable. If your patient is hemodynamically unstable or it is not being stabilized by your ABCDEs, 
your alarm bell should ring there is something else happening you need to investigate further you need to be prompt and proactive otherwise very often with apparently innocuous looking injuries we might have a very significant other injury which might cause a risk to life of the patient because even today the risk of mortality with pelvic injured patients in un in hemodynamically unstable situations is up to 20% then you will have a partially stable situation where the ring could be either an anterior posterior compression type of an injury where the vo pelvic volume expands and the ring opens up or the ring compresses on one side with the lateral compression type of injury still you may have a partially stable situation and what creates this partial stability is the intactness of the of the posterior sacroiliac ligament that is perhaps the most important structure and once that goes you have a hemi pelvis which will go behind and which will go above so identifying these patterns are important one because they tell us about hemodynamically what we are looking at identifying these patterns are important because they will tell us what we need to fix and stabilize these patterns and then you have the sacral fractures and this is the classification system which is probably the most extensive and this is one part of the pelvic classification which most pelvic surgeons use and this is the dennis classification which says that a zone 1 injury goes through the sacral ala a zone through is a transforaminal damage and zone 3 goes medial to the foramen so it could be a single longitudinal break it could be a combination of breaks with a connection either obliquely or transversely so that's a zone 3 injury right the zone 2 injuries are the difficult ones because you have a risk of damage to the neural foramen you have patients who will land up with problems of uh, um, uh, who will have problems of uh, bladder bowel etc right <coughs> so now we come to this injury and any guesses on what you see in this picture from the house <coughs> the gentleman at the back can we start what do you think is wrong here just sit and say there is a superior inferior mi fracture on the left side okay and acetabulum fracture there is an acetabulum fracture anything else there is an iliac blade fracture what else acetabulum si joint of if we collectively put on the views of the house into a piece of paper we will be right we will get a complete picture but if individually we look at our opinions and options and our comments we will miss something and that is why it is important to have an algorithm or a system in which we will assess these injuries you have to look at the pubic symphysis there is a difference in the level of symphysis so there is a anterior ring disruption you have an associated obturator ring breakage on one side probably on both sides it's very difficult to say but do not assume there is no damage by your plain x-ray pelvis because we will come to that plain x-ray pelvis is probably going to be the one thing that we will all do till such time our patient is hemodynamically unstable right so do not disregard the fact that we do not have a crystal clear crystal clear image the third thing is that you look at the for posterior foramina you look at the difference of the joint levels here you look at the opening of the sacroiliac joint here and here and the fracture here and this patient was not treated in 2009 and he came to us in 2014 <coughs> with this and if you go back to this injury 
it is a very simple injury to treat and stabilize. All it needs is anterior ring stabilization, posterior ring stabilization on probably both the sides and this patient would have been walking well. And what do you have? You have a 21 year old boy who has a scoliosis, who has a fixed pelvic obliquity, who has a flexion deformity on both sides, who has an ankylosed hip, whose pelvic ring is badly out of shape. This boy cannot sit. This boy has difficulty in walking. He's kept coming back to us and we ourselves are not very sure what we're going to do with him. So why assess these injuries? So why assess these injuries basically has two components. Chronically what happens, what is the natural history of evolution of these pelvic injury patients? You don't treat them, what happens? Are they good? Are they not good? When we say level of opinion, my patient is doing fine, he does not have a lot of problem. No, it's not that. They have a residual pelvic instability, which could be less than 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15 or more, 10 to 20 or more than 20 mm, which means that they would have difficulty in standing, they would have difficulty in walking, they will have persistent chronic pelvic pain and this is what they will come to you with. So we do, if we do not treat them at the right time, they will come back to us with persistent chronic pelvic pain. Residual deformity with pelvic floor dysfunctions, with incontinence, with dyspareunia, very practical and real life problems. You cannot let these injuries pass and not be treated. Rotational deformities and limb blend discrepancies, scoliosis and muscle weaknesses and abdominal hernias. So that's looking at the natural history of evolution of an untreated pelvic injury patient. What happens in the acute scenario? And a lot of this will be basically a revision of what Professor Ravi sir has already talked to us about. What is the primary aim of assessment of a pelvic fracture? You've got to detect or exclude an injury-induced hemodynamic instability. That is of primary importance and that is the biggest killer in an unstable pelvic injury situation. You have to identify clinically and radiologically what is the level of mechanical instability. And then you have to see what is the extent of solid and soft tissue damage which <laughs> complicates any pelvic or acetabular injury which if present which if there is an open wound increases the mortality in pelvic injury situations to about 60% and that is a major complicating factor. So this beautiful article by Ganselin and Polman which says, this has gone a little up, which essentially says hemodynamic status in patients with pelvic ring injuries is the major prognostic fracture factor for an immediate mortality risk. And patients in extremis, we will come, Dr. Ravi has talked about extremis, we will revise what extremis is, are at a very high risk of mortality. So the cornerstones of assessment of a pelvic injury situation is, we've got to do a gentle thorough clinical examination. It has to be gentle. It does not have to be repetitive. At the same time, it has to allow us to know what is, if there is an anteroposterior instability, if there is a mediolateral or a lateral instability. You have to do a AP X-ray of the pelvis and you have to do an abdominal ultrasound to know whether there is an abdominal bleed or not. And that's the algorithm. We will talk about this in detail. You have a high energy trauma, you do your ABCDEs, you check for pelvic ring stability clinically, you do an x-ray pelvis and all this has to be done in your emergency room. You assess the classification of the fracture and this is the basic reason why I wanted to talk to all of you about the classification first because you have a stable injury which is a type A or a type B or a C injury. Then you do your abdominal ultrasound, you do a fast and you have a positive or a negative fast and you decide on the level of hemodynamic instability and the level of mechanical instability and the basic and you kind of quantify where is my patient. Stable, moderately unstable, extremely unstable, risk of death. So based on that, 
we have to outline as to what we are going to do and that, that is the reason why we talk of the first line of defense, the second line of defense and the third line of defense. But to quantify before doing that, what actually can lead to life threatening hemorrhage? A complex pelvic injury with hemoglobin less than 8 grams on admission, a systolic blood pressure less than 70. This has been added to the <coughs> Pullman's definition by Shun. An absent vital sign, severe shock requiring mechanical resuscitation or use of catecholamines with 12 hours of blood transfusion within first two hours of admission. This is what the European Journal of Trauma article Dr. Ravi referred to. And a class 3 or a class 4 hemorrhage, systolic blood pressure less than 90, a CVP less than 5, an HR more than 100 or 120. That is Trotterman's definition. So, different researchers have talked about different levels of what will be a life threatening hemorrhage, right? So, this is something that we need to identify because this has to treat to be treated within the first hour. If we do not do that, a lot of times we will lose these patients. So, the source of bleeding and unstable pelvic ring situations 80 percent of the times is venous as we talked 15 to 20 percent of the times it is arterial. The venous bleed is usually around the peri vesicular plexus or it is the presacral area near the posterior sacral fractures. The arterial bleed could be in the main trunk of the uh, iliac vessel or it could be one of the division vessels. And these are the injuries which need to be addressed when you are looking at performing a posterior pelvic packing. And the concept as Dr. Ravi very beautifully taught us is the first line of defense is mechanical stabilization of the ring. You cannot control a pe increased pelvic volume or a pelvic ring constriction if you do not have control over the bony architecture of the pelvis because the bony architecture of the pelvis is to a large extent. Uh, based on the iliac bones that we have. So, iliac bones that we have. So, mechanical stabilization is of primary importance. Pelvic plaquing is the second line of defense. And if you have the facility angiographic embolization, even though it has a delay of anything between 4 to 7 hours in the best of setups, in the best of hands. So, those are the three very important modalities. So, clinical examination, you have not only got to look at the pelvis, you will have a blunt injury abdomen, some of them will have a splenic injury, some of them will have a liver laceration, some of them will have a blunt injury abdomen, some will have a urologic injury with a bleed in the urethral meatus. So, if you have a urethral meatus bleed, your patient has a urethral injury. And the examination has to be very gentle, it has to be done not more than twice, otherwise we will further destabilize or cause more damage to our unstable pelvic injury patient. The radiographic assessment, essentially we see the ileanguana line, we see the ileocolas line, we look at the shape of the obturator ring. We look at the pelvic brim posteriorly and the neural foramen and the arcuate lines and we look at the sacroiliac joint and these are the things which should come into our mind as soon as we see a plain x-ray abdomen, a plain x-ray pelvis of any pa patient in the, pel in the emergency. So, suspecting ring instability structurally, is there a deformity of the anterior ring? Less than 2.5 centimeter is usually not going to cause a lot of instability. Once it starts going beyond 2.5 centimeters, always start thinking that is there something happening posteriorly, either at the level of the brim or at the level of the SI joint or at the level of the sacrum. So, a deformity on presentation is a predictor of instability and we have to be very careful and the reason and the way to detect it, detect it is follow the rules, see the ilinguinal line, see the ileoscale line, see the obturator ring, see the pelvic brim, see the arcuate line, see the sacroiliac joint and do it every single time, make it a habit and more often than not we will catch something which is not right. The next thing we see is, is the posterior pelvic ring intact and that is where we will have to do a CT scan, but those will happen once the ring, then the patient is a little more stable. Another indicator predictor of pelvic instability is the OR, where you have an innocuous looking pubic symphysis or a pubic ramus damage. 
which displaces more than 10 millimeters, you have an unstable pelvic injury situation. So if you have a pubic rimus damage which is displacing more than 10 millimeters, you have 100% uh, injury posteriorly as well. And this patient needs to be stabilized posteriorly also. And the clues for a soft tissue injury is, if there is a break in the transverse process of the L5, that is an indicator of damage to the iliolumbar ligament and the posterior sacroiliac complex. And you have a potentially vertical shear in your hands. And that, base, another thing is the ischial spine and the lateral sacral avulsion. So the plain x-ray allows initial fracture classification. It allows significant posterior displacement assessment. It does not provide us complete information about the ring injury and that is why you need special views and the two special views we use for pelvis are the inlet and the outlet views and the inlet view essentially is that the patient is lying supine but when the patient is lying supine the pelvis is already tilted about 45 to 60 degrees so it's not a horizontal pelvis and a beam perpendicular to it it is still a tangential x-ray so the beam is tilted cephalad and this basically tells us about two things. One is it tells us about the pelvic ring which can be constricted and it also tells us about the anteroposterior displacements and the rotational displacements. The other view is the outlet view in which you tilt the beam 45 to 60 degrees and there are different modifications of the outlet view. Uh, but essentially it is you tilt the beam distally and that will tell us about the cephalocaudal displacement. It will tell us about the relative height of the joint and limb length discrepancy. It will tell us about the upper sacral morphology and the upper sacral morphology is very, very, very important to know because if you have a posterior ring instability, if you have to go and put an iliosacral screws, and if you have a morphologically different posterior sacrum, uh, if you have a morphologically different sacrum, then the margin of error for iliosacral screws is very, very small. And you have to be very accurate with your iliosacral screw placement, right? <coughs> a CT scan is actually very important because it gives us critical information in a very short time in a hemodynamically unstable situation. I'm good. It gives us key information on posterior structures of the sacrum and the SI joint. This is fine. And it will tell us about the horizontal and vertical rotational deformities which are best assessed in this situation. The other tool that we have in our hands and that is once you've hemodynamically stabilized your patient is the multiplanar and the 3D CT scan. And they will help us to better quantify the pelvic orientation and to better define the rotational deformities and the displacement. So if you have a pelvic injury, don't jump to do a CT scan. You have to do your assessment. You have to see your x-ray. You have to do your fast. If your patient is <coughs> stable or moderately unstable, then you can do all this. If your patient is into a life-threatening hemorrhage, if your patient is mechanically very unstable, you have to save the patient first, which essentially requires the application of a fixator, either a PC clamp, or the external fixator or the sheet and then look at the life-threatening hemorrhages which may be dealt with by just the stabilization of the pelvis or a pelvic packing or in certain situations the angiographic embolization. A CT angio is very, very important. It tells us about persistent, persistent hemodynamic instability, about the requirement of further transfusion, a venous bleed and thereby the use of binders and fixators. So a venous bleed will stabilize with these but an arterial bleed would require the services of an interventional radiologist, right? <coughs> so these are the conditions that we've already talked about, which we will stabilize. So you have an unstable, uh, uh, unstable disruption of the ring, either anteriorly or posteriorly. You will need to stabilize those. And what is important to understand is that reduction is the easiest in first 24 to 48 hours, but it, it is not necessarily the goal. You have to stabilize the pelvis. If you have an unstable situation, it is important to stabilize the pelvis. Get as good a reduction as you can, but it is important to stabilize the pelvis.
a lot of times the basic reason of why our patients will go have a mortality despite a fair attempt is that we prematurely go in and start doing our definitive treatment and very often the reason is that in the first 28 24 to 48 hours the patient is not completely hemodynamically stabilized and you have to look at and look for a second hit before you start thinking about your definitive treatment so John don't jump to your definitive treatment you have to look for a second hit because a lot of times we will lose our patients because they are not adequately resuscitated and that is very very important <coughs> So we need to have a clearance from the resuscitation and the trauma team. You need to look at the open injuries because the mortality risk with a moral level and an open injury goes up to about 60%. 60%. You have to have the facility of a radiolucent table and fluoroscopy and the technician and the surgeon need to understand what views are necessary. And you need to take precautions with radiation. So the op stabilization options we have as has already been discussed is the C clamp which is horribly expensive, there are modific Indian modifications of the C clamp. This is essentially useful in the stabilization of the posterior pelvic ring. It has its issues but still it is useful. If you cannot do a, this, how good is a pelvic binder as a substitute to the C clamp? Anyone? It is almost as good. The efficacy of a pelvic, of a pelvic binder is almost as good as that of a C-clamp. So it obviates the necessity of having a C-clamp. If you cannot put a C-clamp, then the obvious thing to do is either put a an eye-like fixator or use a supraastabular anterior fixator. And these are fantastic stabilization devices except where you have a posterior ring instability. Even then they will give you some form of stability if uh, applied properly. So that's the algorithm we come back to. So if you have a high energy trauma, the assessment should predominantly be clinically first and you get your pelvis with both hip x-rays, you have a fair idea about the classifications whether it is a, partial, a stable injury, a partially stable injury or an unstable pelvic injury. You do your abdominal ultrasound and based on that you will decide how hemodynamically unstable is your patient which will decide whether you need to do a laparotomy, whether you are just an external fixation will help or whether you will need a second or a third line of defense in the form of packing or angiographic embolization. And to summarize it all, sorry these lines have gone haywire. The hemodynamic status in patients with pelvic injuries is a major prognostic factor for the immediate mortality risk, that is the first message. A patient who is extremely unstable has a high risk of death and the ab it is indicated by absent vital signs or the presence of a shock or an initial systolic blood pressure of less than or equal to 70 which requires mechanical resuscitation and catecholamines despite 12 transfusions in the first two hours. The sources of bleeding in pelvic injury situations 80 to 90 percent of the times are venous which will get controlled by your pelvic binders and your external fixators. In 10 to 20 percent of the times they are arterial which will require an embolization so if we do not have the facility for embolization best to refer. Important parts of the initial treatment concept includes the mechanical ring stabilization combined with hemorrhage control concepts and the mechanical stabilization is performed non-invasively by the binder and invasively by the external fixation or the C clamp. Thank you for a patient here.